Uh, it's good to see all of you. Um, had the privilege of being able to teach um, off and on over the last two years. Um, as you can probably tell, I'm originally from the States. Uh, in particular, I lived in uh, Los Angeles for the last 10 years where I pastored um, a church there. And uh, I just went back this last week. And while I was there, I was um, our church offices in, in Hollywood, of all places, and um, I drove past this one site that always just um, it stood out to me. It's one of Los Angeles' greatest ironies. It's called the Hollywood Forever Cemetery. And I always thought that was so funny. Like, it's a cemetery, and yet it's called Hollywood Forever, and it's got the infinity sign. I'm like, well, you know, it's, it's a cemetery, so technically, um, you know, the idea is that they're no longer living. So um, it just always made me think how interesting we are as human beings. We're, we're very aware of our limits, and yet we desperately long to transcend them. We definitely want something beyond the limits we have in, in life. And I was reminded of an article that I read recently by a man named uh, Dimitri Hamilton. And the title of it was, Is This All There Is? A question that uh, many of us have, have asked in different stages of life. He says, Is This All There Is? is the question my generation is asking of a world that seems increasingly meaningless despite all of our outward progress and technological development. And at any point in your life, I have no doubt that you have asked that. The thing that you really desired, whether it was the job or the relationship or the money or the position, the status, the education, whatever it might be, once you get that thing, at some point or another, in one way or another, you say, is this all there is? Is that it? The thing I was dreaming about, is this it? Well, John, one of the early biographers of Jesus, he's telling us, no, this isn't all there is. There's something beyond us that has actually come to us, or rather someone. He's telling us about Jesus, who has claimed to be the Son of God, come into our world to rescue us and to save us. And his letter is, is being written to tell us who this person is and what his life actually means for our world. And along the way, as you have noticed over the last few weeks, and as you will notice, Jesus actually challenges many of our assumptions about what life is all about, what we actually need in life, and this passage is no exception. And I love this story, which is really a conversation between Jesus and this woman at the well. And through this conversation, not only is he revealing her deepest needs, but actually our own deepest needs. And there's four needs I would like to highlight just for a few minutes together. Four needs I want to highlight. This is a very long passage of Scripture. Actually, Mark and Pete gave me originally the all 54 verses, uh, but we've uh, made the executive decision to narrow it down to just 38. But I want to highlight four themes, four of our needs that can be taken from four key verses in this conversation. And the first need is this, our need for acceptance. It's been recognized uh, universally that our need for, for love, our need for acceptance from the earliest age as children all the way up into to the farthest you know, stretches of your imagination as to how old you could be one day, we have this deep human need for acceptance. And we live in a world where sometimes we get glimpses of that you know, through a, a great family member or a really good friend. But on the other hand, we experience the pain of not being accepted. We experience the pain of rejection, abandonment, betrayal. Uh, one philosopher said, I'm not so different in my history of abandonment from anyone else. After all, we all have been split away from ourselves, from others, and even from the world itself. And that sentence struck me because it uses the term split. I feel like I've been split away. We've all experienced that when you've had an argument with, with a friend uh, or a family member. You feel that distance uh, between you and the other person. So we're all searching for acceptance. We're all searching for this kind of love all the time. It's never just about the money you make. It's never just about the career. It's never just about being within a certain social circle. There's always this need for acceptance. Why? Because there's a sense of separation. And this was the case in John chapter 4. And it's captured in, this, in, in verse 9 as the woman begins to have this conversation with Jesus. Notice what she says there in, in verse 9. The Samaritan woman said to him, You are a Jew and I am a Samaritan woman. How can you ask me for a drink? And in parentheses, 
for Jews do not associate with Samaritans. For a little context, the Samaritans were essentially considered half-breeds by the Jewish population. They were a mix of Jew and Gentile, and there's a whole history there. As a result, they were considered to be outcasts by the Jews. They had their own religious system, which was kind of a mix of pagan, you know, kind of religion with Jewish religion, and therefore the Jewish population considered them to be these outsiders, and she was very well aware of that. She says, why is it that you're having a conversation with me? I'm a Samaritan. You're a Jew. There's this barrier between us. There's a separation between us. But notice earlier on in verse 4, we're told that Jesus had to go through Samaria. It wasn't just because there was some growing persecution happening amongst Jesus and the religious leaders in Judea, which we're told about in verse 1. Beyond that, we notice Jesus is never reacting or responding to a situation. He has a purpose He had to go through Samaria. He had a purpose to visit these people, and in particular, this woman. God's intention was and is to show us, to show us all how our truest needs are met in Him. And so essentially what you have here is this interview that reveals the stage of this woman's transformation. She says, you being a Jew, she was not aware of Jesus being anything more than that. And in the same way, many of us perhaps might be there with this person, Jesus. We're unaware about the truth of who he really is, what exactly he means for our lives today, what he means for the way in which we make choices and decisions, the way in which we view our our future. She's only aware of the social boundaries, boundaries which Jesus in this moment is eliminating and showing compassion. Jesus is showing very clearly in this conversation that it's not our ancestry, it's not our particular you know, brand of religious background or our own human ability that makes us acceptable to God. It is faith in Jesus Christ. That is the resounding message over and over again in John's gospel. It has nothing to do with what you uh, have accomplished. It has nothing to do with where you're from or what you've done. It's based upon who Jesus is. He's come to us in power. He's come to us in grace to open the door for every single one of us. So from the very outset in this conversation, Jesus is challenging all the assumptions of of the religious people of the day. Our acceptance, to put it another way, is not achieved, it's received. It's not something that you can do. It's not based on your pedigree. Jesus is pursuing this woman, and in the same way, he pursues us. Our need for acceptance is ultimately met in the person of Jesus Christ. That's what John is writing to us about. But there's more than that. It's not only our need for acceptance, but secondly, it's our need for satisfaction. That's really when the conversation begins to get interesting. Jesus says, you know, I'm going to give you this water that is going to satisfy a thirst far beyond anything you can imagine. And she still doesn't quite see where he's going with this. And so she responds with this question in verse 12, are you greater than our father Jacob? Wait a minute, this well that they're at, this has some long history. You know, if you read back in the Old Testament, it goes back to the forefathers of the Jewish nation, and this is a well that was attributed to to one of the great ancestors, Jacob. And she's saying, wait a minute, are you saying that you're greater even than this heritage? And Jesus goes on to tell her that she's actually ignorant or unaware of two very key things. Two key things that she needs to know two key things that you and I need to know, and that is the gift of God and the identity of Jesus Christ, the identity of the man sitting right next to her. And to drive this home and to show the relevance of what he's talking about to this woman and to us, Jesus uses this phrase, the living water, a phrase which she takes to be very literal. She's like, well, if there's living water, if I don't have to get my bucket and come to this well every day, then show me this water. Like, that would be great. I would love to not have to do this job. But Jesus takes this misunderstanding as an opportunity to make this massive point. He says, if you drink of this water, you're going to thirst again. And he's speaking, of course, far beyond this well. He's talking about life in general. He's saying, if you're going to look to anything other than God himself in this life to give you satisfaction, you will never, ever be satisfied. You will thirst again. 
And how true is that? I, I know that's true of, of my life. Um, before I became a Christian, and of course, even after becoming a Christian, I'm, I'm made very aware of the fact that anything that this life has to offer, indeed what it promises, which I always find amazing. Uh, some of you might actually be in advertising. I have several friends here in advertising, and I just can't help but to notice all the messages that we take in day after day, the adverts on the buses, in the tube, you know, everywhere you go. The amount of satisfaction that these advertisements, I saw one that was advertising a trip to San Diego, and I think it was literally advertised as like joy and happiness. And I was like, wow, that's a tall order because I've been to San Diego and it's not that great. Um, you know, sure there's sun and sand and I know how tempting that is in February where you'll just do anything. Uh, some of you have already booked your holiday and you're just imagining it in your mind as I think it literally just started raining right now. But whenever you go, think about that holiday. You've booked it, you can't wait for it, and then you get there and you're like, oh, this is good, but the holiday's actually going to come to an end, and guess what? You have to go back to work. Like, did that really satisfy some of you? You're like, wait, what? I just spent money booking it. Yes, I'm sorry to, to inform you that that next holiday is not going to do it for you. Some of you, you, we daydream about the next job or the next stage within our job, or maybe the relationship you're in currently is just not quite scratching the itch, as it were, and you're just, you're wanting more. Jesus is putting into one sentence an experience that we all share. Anything in this world, no matter how much you've been promised, no matter how much you've experienced, it's never going to do it for you. It's never going to fulfill your deepest and truest need for satisfaction. Jesus is saying this very clearly. The more you try to achieve this, the more you try to discover this and find this, the least it's going to satisfy you. It's just not going to meet that deepest and truest need. You may actually feel a little bit of discontent in your life right now, but you're holding out, oh no, next year, 2019, that's going to be my year. 2017 wasn't so great. 2018, it's already February, not going as well as I thought. 2019, that's going to be my year. No, it's not. That's what Jesus is saying to us. And then we begin to blame those things. Oh, it's my job. It's my husband. It's my wife. It's my boyfriend. It's my girlfriend. It's uh, San Diego. It just didn't do it for me. You know, like it's going to be Spain next year. But Jesus is promising something profound. Jesus promises that the water of life that he gives will actually spring up from within you, keeping you constantly satisfied and constantly refreshed. I want to point out five quick things about this statement, water of life, that are absolutely important. Verse 10, Jesus tells us it's a gift. Also in verse 10, he tells us it's living water. Verse 14, he tells us you will never thirst again. He goes on to say this water becomes a spring. It doesn't just mean that you're going to take one sip and be satisfied, but quite literally, this, this source is going to be in your life, a source from which you can draw, like a well, just as they were sitting there at the well, the very source of water. Jesus is saying, you're going to have a source of satisfaction that never ends, and it's going to happen from within you. And the fifth thing is this water gives eternal life. Still somewhat confused, she says, great, give me this water. But Jesus sees her need, knows that she's not quite making the connection here, and so next he reveals our third need. And this one hurts a little bit, but it's for our good. We not only need acceptance, we not only need satisfaction, we need forgiveness. We need forgiveness. Jesus is highlighting here in his conversation with this woman our need for forgiveness. And so he turns a corner and he commands her. He, he tells her, go get your husband. Why does he say that? Why does he say that to this woman who we find out, as, as, as you read, she's, had, she's been with multiple men? He already knows this, but it was for the quickening of her conscience. What he's doing, like a good counselor does, he was putting his finger on the particular need in her life, the particular area of her life where she was really trying to apparently find her sense of satisfaction. And if you look at the life of Jesus, you'll find that he does this over and over again. To, to a, a man that we know from the Bible as the rich young ruler, for him it was money. And so in a conversation with him, Jesus addresses this issue of, of money. For this woman, it was the issue of relationship. Why? Because she, like us, she needs to acknowledge her need. We need to acknowledge our need because no one can ever be saved if we do not first acknowledge our need to be saved. Jesus is addressing 
her need. And I love this passage because it shows us something that we see everywhere else in the Bible. Jesus gets personal. Jesus knows each and every one of us. As the Son of God, he knows our needs. He knows what we're running around frantically trying to find our sense of identity and security in. He knows everything. He is aware of of all that, that we need. And I wonder if we do. Do we notice that? Do we see what Jesus sees in our life? And notice in verse 19, she changes the subject because that's usually what happens um, when you are under some kind of conviction. She says, I perceive you are a prophet. We've got a long history. She just is like, oh, um, you know, now that you've addressed something personal, let's talk about this whole thing of prophecy and prophets. You know, that's a really interesting story. Uh, I remember before I was a Christian having conversations with other Christians, and they would bring up my need to, to be saved, my need for forgiveness of sin, and I, was, and I would turn it into a philosophical debate. I'm like, well, you know, you know, the existence of God, that's a really interesting topic. And I remember this one person I was talking to, like, Tim, you're changing the subject. Or you're at least trying to make it theoretical when God's actually making it personal. This is how God works in our lives. It's not abstract. It's not just up there. He knows your need. He knows what's keeping you from him. And Jesus because he cares, because he's true, because he's the son of God, it would be unloving for him not to address this. And so he gets personal. Even as she tries to shift the conversation away from from the personal to the theoretical, she asks about differences in religion. And Jesus explains in these passages, and in doing so, he actually brings her and us face to face with our need, not just for satisfaction, but even for forgiveness and the emptiness of religion. She says there in verse 19, Sir, the woman said, I can see that you are a prophet. Our ancestors worshiped on this mountain, but you, the Jews, claim that the place where we must worship is in Jerusalem. And here's where Jesus lands, verse 21. Woman, Jesus replied, Believe me, a time is coming when you will worship the Father neither on this mountain nor in Jerusalem. You Samaritans worship what you do not know. We worship what we do know, for salvation is from the Jews. Yet a time is coming and has now come when true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and in truth, for they are the kind of worshipers the Father seeks. God is spirit and his worshipers must worship in spirit and in truth. Jesus is essentially summarizing the whole story of the Old Testament that one day God would send a fulfillment of all that the Bible had promised, a rescuer, someone who would forgive, someone who would would satisfy. And therefore, it would no longer be about a particular location to try to access God, but God himself came to his people. God came to us. God is sitting there with this woman in that moment. And Jesus is essentially saying this, the important thing is knowing God. And God has provided a way for this to happen which Jesus has fulfilled. And this seems to be the turning point for this woman because we learn in verse 25, she goes and she declares plainly to all the people in her town who no doubt knew her, they knew her history, and she says there in verse 25, he must be the Christ. He must be the long-awaited one. So do you see the progress of transformation of this woman? She at first says, oh, well, you being a Jew, and then it moves from, wait, are you greater than, than Jacob? wait a minute, I think you're a prophet. And then the story ends by saying, wait a minute, you must be the Christ. You must be the fulfillment of everything that we need in this life. And of course, the disciples, they come back, they're confused. They're like, wait, don't you need to eat? Like, what's going on here? And Jesus uses this opportunity, and I highlight it with my last point. We need purpose. We not only need a sense of acceptance, We not only need satisfaction and forgiveness, but we need a sense of purpose. And so Jesus uses this, what's happened with the woman at the well, as a lesson for his disciples saying, I have food to eat of which you do not yet know about, and that is to do the Father's work. And what is that work? It's to share this good news with others. And you might even look at Jesus today as a model for your own work. What did he do? He pursued a relationship with others. He didn't allow you know, prejudices or physical need to s- stand in the way. He met this woman right where she was at, which is what Christianity is all about. You don't get cleaned up and then come into the church. Jesus makes you new. 
Jesus guided the conversation. He captured her attention by finding a common ground and explaining who he was in relation to her deepest and truest need. He elevated the conversation. He did not avoid speaking about sin and what she truly needed, and he pointed her to himself as the answer. See, if you're a follower of Jesus, this is precisely what we are called to do. And that is the point being driven home in this chapter. Even if you read it um, later on in your own homework, the end of chapter four, Jesus performs a miracle and it's all about pointing to him as the source of our salvation. It's all about putting faith in Jesus Christ. So I want us to reflect on this today. Jesus says to you, I have the water of life. Have you received that? And are you continuing to receive that? You might be a Christian and you have that well inside of you, but you're not making that choice to continually draw from it. Perhaps some of us have forgotten about it and Jesus is reminding us today, I'm the only one that can satisfy. But maybe today, if you've never drawn from that well, take that first sip and just say, Jesus, I recognize nothing else in this life is gonna satisfy. You're the son of God. You've come to save me by dying on a cross for all of my sins, to remove my guilt and shame so that I could be accepted by God the Father, be in relationship with you for eternal life and to know my true purpose, which is to know you and to share you in this life. I invite you today just to take that first sip and just say, Jesus, I trust you. Let's pray together. Father, the best we know how We confess that nothing in this life, even the greatest things, even friends and family and food and all these other things, they're good, but they can never save us. They can never fulfill that deep need that we were created for, which was to be in relation with you. We acknowledge the best we know how that our sin is turning away from you and trusting in other things besides you. And the best we know how, we say, Jesus, satisfy us. Jesus, save us. For those who are Christians, I just pray that you would teach us to continually draw from you that living water. And for those who have not yet done so, I pray that even today, for the first time, they would say, Jesus, save me. I want to know what it means to find my satisfaction in you. May they experience that anew and afresh, even today. We ask this in Jesus' name. And everyone said, amen.